Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media. Welcome to our webinar on Women in Business, where our distinguished panel of speakers will explore critical issues and opportunities for women in the South African business landscape. Our webinar today is sponsored by Shell Lubricant South Africa and the Richards Bay Industrial Development Zone. We thank them for their support in making this event possible. Before we start, please note that we've activated the Q&A function for your questions. Please direct any questions to the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. While we may not get to every question during our hour together, rest assured we will review each one. Additionally, the chat feature is enabled for your comments and insights. Look for it right next to the Q&A box. Remember though, questions should go into the Q&A to ensure they're properly addressed in that section. Please be informed that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available to you afterwards. We're also broadcasting live on YouTube and the link will be shared in the chat once it becomes accessible. Thanks so much for your attention. Let's begin. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Lael Bethlehem, a partner at economics consulting company Genesis Analytics. She works in the shared value and impact practice, focusing on social and economic development, delivery of complex projects, and the just transition. Lael will facilitate the discussion with our panel, which consists of Nombuso Nsele, Executive Manager of Corporate Services at Richards Bay Industrial Development Zone, Gamase Sodaba, Head of Marketing and Technical at Shell Lubricants South Africa, Sonia Debrain, Principal Partner at Identity Partners, and Fatima Collins, the Women in Mining Project Manager at Sibanya Stillwater. And without further ado, I'll hand over now to our facilitator, Lael Bethlehem, to take the proceedings forward. Over to you, Lael. Thanks very much, Shannon, and good afternoon, everybody. I must say that uh, Women's Month uh, every, every year is a favorite time of year for me. You know, it's a, it's a time both for celebration and for challenge. It's a time for celebration because I think that if we think back on the events of 1956, which gave rise to this particular day, uh, we can see how far our society has come. Uh, both in relation to uh, the, the issues that were raised at the time by the women, because of course we must remember that the 1956 march was a march about past laws, but also particularly in relation to the position of women in society. I think the position of women in society has really transformed uh, in the period since 1956, and we have really so much to celebrate. On the other hand, there's still so much to do. I think all of us feel it. There are still barriers to women. There are still difficulties that women face. There are still many ways in which women have to struggle, uh, particularly in the workplace, uh, in a manner that men uh, do not have to do. So there's so much that we need to address uh, during Women's Month. We must also, I, I think, acknowledge that not all women's lives are the same. Uh, particularly in South Africa, high levels of inequality. Um, there are many um, privileges that are afforded uh, to, to women who work in corporates or women who are in um, perhaps uh, white collar workplaces, that women who are in blue collar workplaces or women who are unemployed or women who live in rural areas uh, just do not enjoy. So we're going to explore some of those issues uh, today, but in particular, we are going to explore the position of women uh, in South African workplaces, the position of women in leadership. And it's really a privilege uh, to be able to, I think, call on such an illustrious panel of women. You know, I think um, if you think back even, I don't know, to, to the beginning of democracy, maybe 30 years ago, would we have a panel like this of women in such senior positions uh, across the economy, across our society? I think we would struggle uh, in those days to have assembled uh, such an illustrious panel of women playing such an active role uh, in leading our economy. So it's, it's really great. Uh, to be able to be one a number um, among a number of fantastic women on 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 this particular webinar. Uh, also great to see a, a big, big participation today and hoping that we can use uh, the hour or so that we have together uh, to really take the debate forward and to hear from women uh, in lots of different contexts. So what we want to focus on today in particular is women in leadership, women in the workplace, women in industry, women in corporates, uh, women in their own businesses, uh, women in uh, the financial environment, women in the mining environment. How are women making their way in the economy? And let's be honest and open with each other as women. How are we doing? Uh, are we finding things easier? Are there challenges that we face? What do we need to do to help 
one another. So let me start off with you, please, Nombusa and Sele, Richards Bay Industrial Development Zone. So Richards Bay Industrial Development Zone is out in northern KwaZulu-Natal. Um, it's not um, in the, you know, it's more in the outlying areas of our country, perhaps women's situation uh, in Richards Bay, uh, which is often an industrial area, a heavy industry. Perhaps li life is not uh, the same for women in that area as it might be, say, in Santon. How are you finding things uh, in Richards Bay uh, as a woman leader? And do you think it's become easier for women to rise into leadership positions, even in, for example, in, in heavy industry? Thank you. Thank you so much, Lel, uh, for that question. Uh, yes, we are in Richards Bay, a very remote area of which I love this industry. Uh, maybe to start off, let me just cover the background general, then I will answer uh, specifically for the RPIDZ. Uh, in my opinion, I would say not yet. Uh, it's not becoming easier for women to rise to leadership positions in SA. My uh, response is based on the research that was conducted by SA Statistics that indicates that 22% of the executive management positions in South Africa are only accommodated by women, which is a very low percentage. And out of that, only 6% of women are CEOs uh, held by women in South Africa. There are still companies with no women executives at all. So we are not doing well as the country. I would say significant challenges still exist, even with uh, the improvements in the participation of women in senior roles in South Africa, but still they, they, we need to improve uh, as the country. Men have been leaders for so long. Uh, the problem is that uh, the traits associated with leadership are often thought of as being masculine and not viewed as favorable when exhibited by women. So this is the main, main reason why it's becoming difficult for women to climb the ladder. So women continue to face significant barriers into reaching the top leadership positions in the, in the organizations, including the gender biases, uh, issues of unequal access of uh, networking opportunities and work-life balance challenges, which we experience as women. So those are all the barriers that are hindering women to climb up the ladder. Addressing these issues, LIN, is essential for uh, realizing for us as South Africans to realize the full potential of diverse leadership. Also, holding each other's hands as women can take us far. In my industry, Urichas Bay Industrial Development Zone, management comprises of more than 50% uh, females. But when you look at the top level, level, which is the senior leadership level, men are 60% which is still a challenge. Uh, it's still difficult for us uh, to, 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 to climb the ladder, even in my organization. So when I was doing my research, uh, I also came across the few challenges uh, with regards to this. Uh, in, in, in essence, women are expected to prioritize family uh, as well as the domestic responsibilities over their careers. Uh, and then the leadership aspirations are also affected, making it challenging for them to break through these systematic barriers. Another issue, Lyle, uh, is that uh, disproportionately affects women leadership across South Africa is the issue of the gender-based violence. Uh, you cannot work and think effectively when you are being affected at home, when you are being experiencing the gender-based violence at home. So those are the challenges that also hinder and uh, barriers for women to climb up the ladder. And also the issue of family responsibilities can also limit our women the ability to pursue the leadership positions. That is because uh, despite the fact that we have uh, full-time jobs, there is also another significant challenge that women are in leadership and management roles face, uh, which is the expectation to balance the two, which is the family responsibility as well as the work life. So the issues of work-life balance concerns where women are more likely than men to have primary responsibilities for childcare, uh, responsibilities of household duties, it also affects them to climb up the ladder. So in RPIDZ, uh, we focus in uh, the growth and development initiatives, both for internal and external stakeholders, internal stakeholders being our employees and external stakeholders being our stakeholders and other community members through the issues of upskilling and the issues of reskilling, the issues of personal development, internships and learnerships. That's where we try to groom our women to be able to climb up the ladder. We also focus on issues of incubation programs uh, where we do our mentorships and trainings for the small businesses, the emerging businesses that are owned by women 
just to encourage them to be able to stand on their own, to be able to play a leading role and participate in the economy. It will also assist them to climb up the ladder and also focusing, focusing on training our SMMEs, uh, aligning them with the key sectors of, of our, of our uh, uh, initiatives, which is the ICT and innovations, the issues of manufacturing, the issues of agro-processing. So those are the initiatives that we have as RBIDZ in trying to address uh, this issue we are facing as the South African uh, women uh, in leadership. So as part of my recommendations, Lael, I would say maybe industries should encourage mentorship and sponsorships, which can also provide women with the support and guidance they need to succeed in leadership roles. And uh, maybe each woman to have a sponsor, uh, to have a mentor, to have a coach. Uh, Lael, I was attended a Women's Day event where we asked how many women have sponsors, how many women have coaches. And I realized that it was just a small number in a room, a room of 500 people. So let us encourage our women to have a sponsors, to have mentors, to have coaches. It will assist them to grow up. And also industries to develop policies that will support more women development than men. So as to strike the balance between the two. The initiatives should also drive the improvement of women in leadership. Also, the issues of fostering the culture of equality and diversity can assist the organization and also the implementation of inclusive hiring policies and practices. Uh, I will end there, Lael, for my question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nombu. So you, you, you've, I think you've given us a great start because you've touched on quite a number, um, quite a number of different areas. I want to thank you in particular for touching on the issue of women's own consciousness, uh, the extent to which we feel uh, confident in the workplace will make a very, very big difference to our own ability uh, to work in male dominated industries. Um, so the, the whole issue of women building up their own confidence uh, of us um, empowering each other emotionally and psychologically, encouraging each other. Uh, this is also, I think, a very, very serious issue for, uh, for women in the workplace. Um, Thank you for, for getting us started on a number of different uh, aspects uh, there, Nobuso. And thank you also to the Richards Bay IDZ for, uh, for being one of the sponsors this afternoon uh, of this important uh, webinar. So our other sponsor this afternoon is Shell Lubricants. And we have with us Gamase Sodaba uh, from Shell. Um, Gamase, tell us what it's like to work in a male-dominated industry. You know, when we think of women in leadership, I don't think many of us think of, uh, of oil companies. Um, tell us what it's like to work in a male dominated industry? And in general, can you just uh, share with us what you think are the most challenging aspects uh, for women in, in corporate South Africa today? Um, thanks, Lyle. I think for me, I'll start by saying we can do it. We are capable, just like men, as a starting point. Um, we should not um, actually start classifying certain segments or certain jobs um, and, um, and categorize them strictly for men. Women are as capable, that's a starting point. However, yes, it is a challenging um, that I will acknowledge. Um, I find that uh, women uh, tend to bring a different um, aspect into the organization. I think we are known for warmth, for compassion. We are the best communicators. However, I would want us as women not to let these traits define us because we can do everything end to end. Now, when it comes to some of the challenges that we tend to face uh, in the workplace, based on my personal experience, what I've realized is we work 10 times harder because as Nombuso has mentioned, uh, some of us have sponsors, some other people have no sponsors. In the midst of whoever is watching you in the process, you have people that are really, really rooting for you to make it to the top. And they on the journey, they are clapping for you. In the process, you have people that are really waiting for you to fall and fail, to prove a point that says women can't do it. So for me, what I find is women in some of the challenges that, um, that we, we experience is the fact that we work 10 times hard, harder. However, we do deliver the, the results just like men do. So for me, all I want to say is the challenges are there. Um, we found our own way to navigate the space. And in this case, I'll lean more on us working 10 times harder, but at the results day, it's proven. If you were to look um, and in South Africa, for example, in the top 40 listed companies in the JSC, only 10% of those are, are led by females, right? And actually they're doing well. So it does tell you that, you know, um, we should stop the segmentation of roles to say this can only be done by females, this can only be done by males. Uh, all of us are capable. The key is, is is that we just need to lean on, on, on our experiences and on our traits. 
one key thing though that I would like us as women um, to, to really dig deep as well and really understand ourselves better. I do think that we actually have a problem as well, which starts from home in the communities that we live in. As a starting point, if you look at the home front, we already say this can only be done by boys, this can only be done by girls. Yeah. Why are we doing that? That's the question we should be asking ourselves. And then when we come, we leave now the, the, the home front, it's eight o'clock, I'm at the office. You expect me now to behave differently because we can prove to men that we can do it when at home we've already pushed a certain narrative of certain things that can only be done by men or, or boys or girls. I think for me, as females, we really, really need to dig deep and stop um, um, outsourcing the responsibility to men and expect men to drive the change. We own it at home in the communities that we lived in as a starting point because by the time you get to the office, that foundation should already be there. Uh, it should then not be difficult for us uh, or for companies or organizations for that matter now to start tapping on, you know, trainings for diversity and inclusion and all of these different nuances. It can, we can build it from home. Um, however, the challenges are there. Um, but to us as women, all I can say is we can do it. It's possible. We are capable just like men. Thank you, Gamase, for that encouragement. Um, you, you remind me of some articles I read yesterday about uh, the USA. Um, there was an, a very interesting comment made by Hillary, uh, by Hillary Clinton, who said that the American presidency is the hardest of all glass ceilings, and that she herself had bumped uh, her head against it. Um, and she was encouraging Kamala Harris uh, to become uh, the first president of, of, of the USA. Uh, and interesting, I, I also heard them chanting, yes, she can, yes, she can. And I think you've, e you've echoed that today. Um, by saying, you know, that us uh, having faith in ourselves and having faith in each other is a very important part of the equation. Um, that this is, we, we already know that women are as capable uh, as men in, in all environments. What we need now is for everybody to acknowledge that and for everybody um, uh, to feel it. Uh, just before I move on, Gamase, you, you know, since you and Nombusa are both in kind of heavy industry, um, if I can put it that way, where, where I think these are, you know, very male dominated uh, uh, industries. Um, can I ask you, you know, what interventions can one make in workplace culture in those sorts of, of industries to make sure that women are able to rise uh, with, within, within the company level? Thanks, Lila. I think just to, to add on that one for me, th there's a key thing that organizations um, need to be mindful of and start living. If you go to almost any company at reception or somewhere along the line as you walk through the different floors, you will find the company values. Now, the question for me is, is the company leaving the company uh, the company values? It's displaying everywhere. So indeed, Nombuso is right. There's a very important role that the culture and the environment of the organization should be conducive um, for, for women to thrive and progress in terms of their careers. Um, if there's a disconnect in the values um, that are displayed on boards and obviously how people are leaving the values as an everyday engagement, then that becomes the problem. So for me, the, it's very important that as companies draw their beautiful strategies and their values and, and all of these different nuances and they have designed these policies on diversity and inclusion. I mean, I'd like to think most companies at this moment in time, every year, almost everybody goes to a training for di uh, but diversity and inclusion. But the most important thing is after that one hour session, are we then leaving those values? That for me is very important. And I think if then the, 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 the company leaves the, val the values and in fact the employees and the leadership demonstrates that it builds on confidence uh, of women it builds just generally on people being there and giving their all. The, the lack or the disconnect between the two will eventually or to a certain degree will influence how employees view this company and um, whether it's from a cultural environment a point of view in terms of how I'm feeling in the space, whether it's um, around just end to end generally on how the company will be viewed. So for me, there's a huge connection between uh, the company leaving its values uh, and leadership de intentionally demonstrating um, uh, this because also if you if you think about bullying in the workplace um, which I think it's been an outcry um, you read any newspaper there's always an issue um, 
th there's an element that says certain people feel the policies are just there to protect the company. It should not be the narrative. The policies should be there to protect the employees end to end. Everyone should enjoy the benefits of having these policies um, that um, the company lives by, not that the policies should be there um, to, to protect the company versus the people that um, are working in the company and in fact delivering the value for the for the organization. So for me, again, culture and the environment is very important because that will determine if people really thrive in that space. Um, and also people will ask that saying the opportunities for them to say, because of what I see in this organization, indeed there's a future for me. If I were to speak for myself in my current role, um, really, the leaders that have held my hand to, to the position that I am, for me, I give them 100 brownie points. I am because of them. Well, thank you, Kamasi. I think you've given us uh, some really important points there. You know, one of the things that you've said is that we need to build our confidence individually as women. But on the other hand, this is not all about just us and what we have to try to do and how we have to uh, uh, try and show up in the workplace. Uh, it's also about the company. It's about the company being accountable uh, for its environment, making sure that uh, we, we can feel comfortable uh, making sure that if we work hard and do well, that there are prospects for us in companies, making sure that when there is uh, unacceptable behavior, that there are consequences uh, for that behavior. So the responsibility is not only on women uh, to build up our own confidence, our own skills, our own experience to encourage each other, but very much uh, a question of accountability uh, for the company to make sure that we are in um, a safe working environment and an encouraging uh, working environment. So, so thank you very much. So we've heard from Nombuso and Gamases um, uh, so far, and they're both women who work in uh, in heavy industries. Well, another woman who works at the coalface, if I can put it that way, um, is Fatima Collins, who works at Sibanya Stillwater. So Fatima, you are working in the mining industry. Uh, I believe you are actually uh, even today attending a session of Women in Mining South Africa, WIMSA. Uh, we know the mining industry has made a, a really big effort uh, to try to address uh, some of the um, some of the historical issues that hold uh, women back. Of course, um, uh, you know it's not that long ago that it was illegal for women to work underground. Um, so, so that very uh, first fundamental um, barrier had to be uh, removed. Um, but even now, we know that even with all the encouragement in the mining industry, we still know that there are um, uh, significant challenges. And we know that because uh, one of the international mining companies, uh, Rio Tinto, a few years ago published a very, very interesting report called Everyday Respect, um, which uh, which really, I, I think, taught us a lot about what's really going on in the mining industry, not only in South Africa, uh, but also around the world, uh, particularly with regard uh, to bullying, uh, which has come up already, um, racism, uh, but also gender discrimination and gender-based violence. And I think Rio Tinto deserves a lot of um, a, a lot of credit for publishing uh, that report because I think it has given us all a window into the conditions that women uh, sometimes face and given us all a lot of motivation for having to do something about it urgently. So Fatima, tell us about what's happening in the mining industry. Uh, tell us how it feels to be at WIMSA this year um, and tell us how we uh, can learn from the mining industry about how to address uh, a workplace culture and how to establish a culture of respect. Over to you, Fatima. Thanks, Lyle. So, um, you know, the, the mining industry is very male dominated. And like you said, it's only since I think the 90s, the mid 90s, that women were actually allowed to go underground. When you look at a country like South Africa, we sort of unofficially have an um, unemployment rate of about 30%, um, 35% for women. We are the biggest employers of um, in the country, the mining industry. So we, we absolutely can't leave a huge chunk out uh, a chunk of our population out of being employed. Um, the other thing is that there's such skill shortages. If we only look at one gender, we're not going to um, meet the skills gap in, in the country. So there's no way we can exclude women. But having said that, um, mining was initially, you know, back in the 1800s, this was, it was established um, from a very militaristic base. So what, what, what the military did was then sent military people to mine. So that was the culture that, that started. And now, we, now we're opening it up to women um, in the last 30 years for underground. 
Um, so it's a huge, it's a huge culture shift. Um, what we need to do as uh, as women in the mining industry, and what we talk about here at the WOMSA symposium as well, is um, look at policies and procedures, because you you need to look at policies that enable women. We need to look at um, a zero tolerance for gender based violence. And when we look at policies and procedures, we also have to look at stuff like infrastructure and technology. So um, th that includes something as simple as the PPE. It it's different for men and women. We need yeah. to look at our toilets, you know, basic stuff, sufficient lighting. How do we how do we ensure that women are safe underground? How do we find women? How do we um, make our reporting channels easier? When it comes to gender-based violence, we spoke to some survivors here at the um, Women in Mining Symposium, and they said, just make it easy to report whether it's through our police systems, our court systems, and we're seeing more of that, you know. The, the victim is uh, usually more, um, is, is intimidated compared to the perpetrator, you know. What were you wearing? How were you dressing? This is a place of work. We all meant to be here, and we all have equal rights to be here. Um, South Africa is a signatory to the uh, C-190 Convention of the International Labour Organization. And they've redefined work in the places of work. A lot of us work from home. So what happens if we experience domestic violence? Yes, our employer is responsible for taking that up on our behalf. Um, what if we meet a, a, a service provider or a colleague in the shopping mall and he talks to me inappropriately? I am allowed to take that up through my employer. The world of work is not just defined as your desk and your laptop anymore. It's defined as anyone that interacts with you, whether on the premises or off the premises. We also need to realize that it's a very, um, it's a very labor, in, for, for women that work underground, it's very labor intensive. So what do we do for, for that? We need to, we need to, uh, we need to do uh, ergonomic studies to ensure that certain positions are, women are best placed for certain positions. We, we need to mechanize in the mining industry. What can we do? How can we automate so that more women can join the industry? We need to um, do huge cultural training, diversity training, underground as well as on top. The, the difference level between the sexual harassment in the office and sexual harassment underground is very well life and death. Yeah. Because you are so much more vulnerable underground. Um, but it's also about educating our women as what as to what their rights are. You know, um, Somebody at the at the conference said, "If it doesn't feel right, it isn't right," and basically that's the rule of thumb. If if it's making you feel awkward, that's enough. We don't need to question it more than that. Um, with with regards to gender based violence, the the only way to build trust in an organisation with sexual harassment, bullying, gender based violence, is to sh show consequence for transgressors. Because if if I want to come in with my story. And I see that nobody's listened to the per previous person. Um, then that's the problem, you know. I, I um, was talking to somebody in the banking industry, and they said that when anybody committed fraud in the company, their photo would go up in a notice board prior to emails, and now an email it goes out in a newsletter. Name and shame, and we need to do the same with sexual harassment and bullying. If 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 there's an ethical problem around. Um, actually naming the person than statistics. This month, so many people were dismissed for these reasons. So people can understand that, that something is being done. Um, we're some way with that, but we still got a long way to go. Um, in terms of policies for women, work-life balance is so important. And Nambusa and, uh, and, and Kamashe also, also touched on it. We've got so many responsibilities. By the time we get to our office, we have made the lunch, put in the washing, fed the old, fed the dog, all of that. Whereas a man wakes up and he gets to his office. So we need to incorporate policies that talk to work-life balance. We need to, you know, it's it's not um, collaboration is 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 is, uh, is is the fence is the in thing now, not competition. We're not competing with each other. We need to collaborate with each other, and we need to trust just to build trust within our employees. I find that. Women are women very seldom, very seldom abuse um, their trust in the workplace because they work that much harder to prove themselves. So mm -hmm. if they need to be at the at the doctor for three hours with their with their child, we should be more output based. It's a bit it's a bit different when you're working underground and you're working in production. Um, your hours are fixed. But again, again, understand that 
there's, there's certain times uh, that women will be on the road, make it safe for them. Uh, companies allow, you know, company transport, et cetera, panic buttons, uh, connectivity. So um, in terms of that, we have to go back to the basic when it comes to trying to incorporate women in the mining sector. Thank you. Fantastic, Fatima. I think you've um, you've really highlighted so many important points. But you know, one of the things that I find most interesting about women in the mining industry um, is that you know there's been an acknowledgement, I think, uh, in in the last few years that uh, gender-based violence is, among other things, a safety issue. It's not only a diversity and inclusion issue, which it certainly is. It is a safety issue. If women are not safe from gender-based violence underground then they are not safe underground. They are going to be hurt psychologically and physically. And the mining industry has done, I think, such great work in addressing uh, health and safety, really uh, historic work uh, in bringing down uh, the injury and fatality rates really dramatically in the mining industry. And we, we know that that happened because an effort was made, because it started to really matter uh, to leaders in the mining industry that people are safe at work, that people are safe underground. Um, and, you know, that happened because there was the intent, uh, a coordinated uh, effort, and where money had to be spent, it was spent. Um, and I think that's the attitude we also need for, for gender-based violence um, in, in society as a whole uh, and in the workplace. It's going to stop only when we all want it to stop. And only when the leaders of our society really take it on uh, in the way that we've uh, taken on health and safety uh, in the mining industry. Um, but that, so, you know, the, yeah, please, Fatima. Sorry, sorry. To that point, Lyle, there's two, there's two things. Health and safety became an issue because it, be, it became a license to operate. Right. So you could get shut down, you know. Gender-based violence is still seen as a social ill and not a criminal offence. And we need to change that. So, so for example, the law says, if I see if I see you murdering someone and I don't report it, I I am culpable. It says the right. same thing for gender-based violence, child abuse, molestation, sexual harassment. Yet within families, even people keep quiet about these issues. So so it's still seen as a social ill, um, as opposed to you know um, a, a legal issue. And 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 the, and we need to make it a license to operate thing, because. I can tell you fatalities may or may not have come down and safety may or may not have increased had it not been a license to operate. Thank you, Fatima. I hope everybody is listening and has their have their ears open very wide. And I think we should all be quoting Fatima when she says gender based violence is not simply a social ill. Gender based violence is a criminal matter and anybody who keeps their mouth shut uh, is participating. Uh, in that gender-based violence and enabling it. So I think uh, both you and Gamase have uh, have really emphasized there needs to be consequences for bullying, uh, for discrimination, for racism, uh, certainly for, for gender-based violence. Uh, thank you so much, Fatima. So Sonia De Brain, uh, wonderful to have you um, to have you with us. Um, you are um, a founding partner in Identity Partners, um, a woman-led uh, investment holding company. Um, so you are not sitting in the sort of heavy industries of mining and oil uh, and out in, in, in Richards Bay. Uh, you are working in, in finance, you are working in financial services in the corporate world. Um, but surely even in that world, uh, there are challenges uh, for women. Uh, tell us how you are seeing uh, the rise of women, uh, the development of women leaders uh, in your sector, uh, in, in society as a whole. Uh, and tell us what it's like to be the founder of a woman-led uh, investment holding company. Oh, Lal, thank you so much for the warm welcome and setting the scene so appropriately this afternoon. It's a real honor to be on this panel uh, with my esteemed panelists, women from the heavy industries, as you've said. And um, I think hopefully the relevance for my participation this afternoon is that the business that I'm privileged to lead, Identity Partners, as you said, women-led investment company, um, our main aim is to take women into sectors where traditionally we are underrepresented and have been underrepresented. And that's why um, it, it really is an honor to be here on this panel with women from industries where traditionally we've been underrepresented and in leadership positions where you are, we can see that you are advocates and giving voice 
uh, to the issues of women. Um, for us, we felt that it was important for women to have a seat at the table. And with our shareholding representation, we often also have a board seat. And so to be able to utilize that board seat to give voice to what you're saying, uh, uh, Lyle, how do we see women uh, being able to effectively participate more in industry? And as you've said, my home industry is finance. I think the relevance, as you all know, is that financing and access to finance cuts across all sectors, and it is the lifeblood of economic participation, economic emancipation of women, which is very much part of their holistic well-being as well. Um, and so for us, we've you know been fortunate enough to 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 have investments in some of these key sectors. Um, and you know, one which is taking up a lot of my time at the moment is in the rail sector um, in particular. So infrastructure, mining, um, and also in you know, services. Um, and and how do we give voice? So obviously making sure, and I think both of you, Nombuso, and Gamase um, um, mentioned the statistics in terms of women leadership on the stock exchange, you, you know, or in business. So making sure that boards are more representative. Um, Fatima, you've talked about DE and I and, you know, license to operate as well. So, um, you know, hopefully companies would buy into the philosophy, notwithstanding that there is also a stick um, approach now, especially with a focus on ESG. Um, and ESG being so topical, boards having to address that. Um, and then also in C-suite appointments, trying to ensure that there are no excuses for having good female candidates, good black candidates who are considered for C-suite roles. And 30 years into our democracy, there can't be excuses any longer that we can't find them. <laughs> um, and Fatima, you talked about how late it was that women were able to come underground. So, you know, we need to be far ahead of where where, where we've been. And sometimes quotas, targets, you know, they, they do assist, assist. So, you know, at a board level, being able to ask those questions, ensuring that supply chains are opened up, procurement opportunities are opened up, so that more women can participate, barriers to entry are lowered. Um, and in the event that, uh, you know, we are able to, to pierce more deeply, for example, sitting on a remuneration committee, um, you know, being able to ask the right questions about equal pay for equal work. Um, and Lal, uh, um, um, you know, you may be interested to know that for, from 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 my point of view, it's kind of a personal point of view. It's not only currently do we ensure that men and women in the workplace are remunerated equally, but also what do we do of women of the past, our mothers, our aunties, our gogos, because their pensions would have been pegged to what would have been discriminatory against women in the past because there was an equality, um, and so how. How are there opportunities for catch up? Um, and so, uh, you know, I know it's a broad topic, uh, but hopefully, uh, you know, we can embrace wherever we sit as these fine women here in, in this panel and amongst our audience um, are all women who have an interest in the topic of, of forwarding women's interests in the workplace. And I've even seen on the chats, you know, some of the introductions someone was talking about their, their PhD or their thesis research, um, you know, it's wonderful to see, and Crema Media giving us this, this platform, it's wonderful to see that all of us, wherever we are based, I always say, you know, wherever you find yourself, you can be an agent for change. You can use your seat, um, you know, to occupy space on behalf of all women. Uh, so thank you for including me, although, you know, my background is a little bit different, yeah. Well, well, thank you so much, Sonia. And I, I love what you've just said about uh, all of us um, being advocates uh, for women, all of us uh, using whatever space we have in our own companies, on board seats, in the media. How can we constantly uh, keep this issue on the agenda, not only in, um, in Women's Month? Um, you know, Sonia, actually, if I think about it, um, the finance sector in some senses has been, has been a leader, perhaps. Uh, I mean, if I think back, uh, Whiphold, 
uh, being one of the first, um, I think, pioneers of bringing women into the mainstream of, of equity finance in particular. Uh, if I think of the Women's Development Bank, uh, also, I think, wonderful, wonderful pioneers, uh, black women um, uh, in, 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 in both of those entities. Uh, I think we've had a, a, a woman a chair of the Reserve Bank. Uh, if I think a woman governor of the Reserve Bank, if I think back to Jill Marcus, we've had um, a woman CEO of ABSA uh, in the person of Maria uh, Ramos. I don't think we've had any other uh, major bank uh, female CEOs uh, that, that I can remember, but perhaps uh, the finance sector has actually uh, uh, done very well in this respect. Yeah, and it's linked back to what Fatima is saying, also licensed to operate, right? Mm -hmm. So where we have to have um, demonstration of control, management control. It does. It does help that there are these incentives, carrot and stick. Lal, um, we're very fortunate. Mary Vilakazi, not too long ago, was appointed uh, uh, CEO of First Strand. But you know what I like about the parallels Thank that you. you <laughs> not at all. What I like about the parallels that you've drawn, where. And, and maybe it touches a little bit on what Gamase was saying in the workplace. Do we support each other? Do we collaborate each other? I enjoy with each other. Sorry. I enjoy the fact that you see senior women promoting other women. You know, for example, at Jill Marcus, remember after she left the Reserve Bank, she was the first female chairman of ABSA. Right. And right. then uh, Wendy Lucas Bull, also chaired ABSA. And it took those women to appoint a Maria, a Maria Ramos as the first female CEO of a bank. You know, the mm -hmm. same when Cheryl Carolis was at SAA. Um, you remember she appointed um, the first female CEO. CEO. Yeah, of SAA. Um, yeah, and so I think hopefully we can always show better examples of women promoting other women than the opposite. Wonderful. You know, and to show the quality of their leadership. Well, thank you for reminding us, uh, reminding me of uh, Mary Villacazzi, a very, very prominent um, uh, business uh, leader in our society. Uh, and also thinking back, you know, to... Um, to people like uh, Zaneli Mbeki, uh, Zaneli Mbeki, who I think played such a big role uh, yeah. in promoting women in the very early years uh, of our democracy. Um, mm. and, and many other women, I think, in finance who've paved the way. Gamase, you were going to come in uh, on, on this particular point. Yes, uh, thanks, Leila. I think I wanted just to add a comment on what Sonia mentioned. Uh, we really, as a female leaders, need to make the most of the positions that we had to pick each other up and promote each other. Uh, we really cannot rely on legislation and policies um, to get women, because I feel, you know, us heavily reliant on uh, policies, because it's, it's, an, uh, it's, a, it's a, a license to operate, you need to have so many female leaders in your, in your, in your executive team. I feel we're being dragged as poor souls, and we are not. We are equally important and deserving a seat at the table, just like the rest of the other gender. So I just wanted to add that, that we really cannot rely on legislation to bring us on board. Um, because, I mean, even with legislation, the change is not as fast as we would like, to, like it to be. Um, there is a bit of a shift. But in all fairness, if you were to look at the South African population, 51.5% of the population is females. But still, we are nowhere when it comes to occupying our senior leadership roles and um, executive director positions. Well, thank you for that um, for that reminder, Kamasi. Uh, you know, I do think that um, we all need to be the kind of advocates that uh, that that you are encouraging us to be. Um, and, and, and speaking of that, I, I'm just looking at the chat and seeing that there are a number of different, uh, uh, really interesting points um, that are um, that are coming up. But before I go to two particular questions in the chat, I just want to bring in uh, Nombuso on, on this particular point that we've just covered now. Nombuso, over to you. Thanks, Lael. I just wanted to add on the issue of having a 6% CEOs in the country. Maybe mm -hmm. if we can enforce the issue of implementing our employment equity targets as organizations, it can also help. We do we do these fancy plans, uh, we submit to the Department of Labor, but we are not complying to them. When it comes to the appointment, we just appoint anyhow. 
So maybe if you can have this strict enforcement on how to comply with our employment equity, it can also assist in improving uh, this gap that we see. And again, conducting benchmarking uh, with other countries, especially the countries with female presidents, with female leadership, and maybe to gain uh, the strategies that they are using in order for them to um, having women occupying the higher positions can also assist our country. So as women, let us come together and come up with a, a, a document that we all use just to influence this uh, initiative. Thank, thanks, Leo. I just wanted to add that. Great, thank you very much. You know, um, the point has come up here and, and is being picked up in, in the chat. I think it's a point that Sonia um, originally made uh, about the question of catch up. Um, so, and, and I think now, on the chat is um, is is raising that as a question. So so what do we do about uh, catch up? Um, you know, if we think about all the years that women uh, did their work and did their work diligently and were not uh, were not equally paid and were not equally recognised. I mean, I guess part of it is is just down uh, to history. Um, in a sense, we we stand on the shoulders of those women because they showed the resilience, the tenacity. The discipline to just carry on despite uh, all of uh, the discrimination that was taking place, and I guess they've they've really prepared uh, the ground uh, for us. Um, but Sonia, how do you? Perhaps I can bring you back in here. How, how do you see this issue of equal pay? Um, yeah. I mean, you've said to us we shouldn't only think about going forward. Uh, is there anything to be done about the past? Yeah. So you know, uh, perhaps. Um, and perhaps it's as you said, Lal. One can put it down to history, but what are the, what are the learnings? What are the lessons? And can we have corporate spend that then overspends or upweights its spend relative to women? So I don't mean as in women should be paid more, but can we have more initiatives? which will help women with mid-career um, executive learning, for example, um, have upweighted in terms of women's uh, uh, leadership advancement programs. Um, and so not to be self-conscious about overspending or over-promoting on women as a form of, as a form of catch-up. Um, and then, you know, uh, over time, because it'll take a long time to equalize if we just carry on at the rate that we, we currently are carrying on. And to be, at, whether, you know, it's on government side or business opportunity side, perhaps to be um, unashamed about subsidized financing, guarantee schemes, schemes that are in place to help women-owned businesses to get a step up. Um, and so that the the level the the leveling of the playing field can happen more speedily, and then to be more fav favorable towards women candidates in roles. Um, I think there was another question about how do we make sure that uh, you know we we equalize in terms of gender representativity. So you know one of the things that I've seen like in the private equity space is that if you don't have a female black candidate who is on a short list for a key role, there needs to be an explanation as to why not. Right. As opposed to saying these are the best two or three candidates um, and now this is where we're selecting from, there also needs to be a motivation if all of those candidates are white males, why that is the case. So, so uh, maybe now it's not kind of direct um, each female beneficiary there being a catch up, but maybe us ensuring that there's catch up across the board for women as a cohort in management leadership position as as women business owners, etc. Fantastic. Um, uh, you know, I, I think um, it, it's so interesting to think about what you're saying, um, because it really does remind us that uh, the past is still with us. And on the one hand, we are, um, I think women like us in the workplace, we are the beneficiaries. Uh, of all of that hard work and all of that um, resilience that was shown by the generation of, of, of our mothers and also the generation of, of our grandmothers. Um, but actually, Sonia, if I think about it, you share a surname 
uh, with, a, with a very famous South African woman, uh, Sophia de Brain, who was one of the four uh, women leaders of the 1956 uh, Women's March to the Union Buildings. Um, interesting to share her surname. I, I'm sure that um, I'm sure that the, that, that the women who, who marched uh, in, in 1956, um, for them to have imagined a woman like you, you know, a person who has founded and, and owns a private equity uh, company, it, uh, it, must have seemed, uh, it must have seemed beyond their wildest dreams at the time. No, that's such a kind mention. You know what I, I often say to people, our mother's generation and Gogo's generation, they marched for us, for us to get the vote and for us to experience democracy. Now that we are in democracy, it's up to us and our generations to make sure that we can live out those aspirations. And what, you know, the barriers to living those out are usually economic. So what does it mean now you can take your kid, your kid to any school, you can go to any hospital or you can live in any neighborhood. If you can't afford it, you know, what does this democracy mean? And so it, that's why it's so heartening to be, you know, part of these conversations and hearing the wonderful work that other women are doing, because as you're saying, that generation, we're the beneficiaries of it. What are, what are we going to do in our generation, um, you know, to take this forward? So, and the other thing that I often uh, refer to in terms of our mother's generation is that they had the foresight to say, each of the, the four women who led the march represented one of the racial groups of South Africa. Mam Lillian Ngoy, Black women, Helen Joseph, White women, Rahima Musa, Indian women, and my, my beloved mum, Colored women. So they had a vision of the future of South Africa being multiracial, equality across all races and diversified, diversified and inclusive, you know, the way we talk about it today. And I really hope that we can hold on to that and, you Absolutely. know, uh, carry that forward in our own way. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you. Fatima, I'd like to bring you back in here. Um, you know, um, a far cry from the boardrooms of Santon um, are the uh, are the sort of mining areas of the Northern Cape and of uh, the Northwest. And I think one of the um, sort of really on the ground challenges that the mining industry has faced is in relation to skills, um, because the skills that we that women require to be in 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 mining. Um, are, are are really extensive. Some of them are are skills related to one's ability just to um, you know uh, withstand certain kinds of environments, um, to be able to just have the, the the tenacity to work out in a rural area, uh, often in a very remote place. Um, but then there are also the technical skills. Um, what can you tell us about what the mining industry has done uh, to promote both the hard skills and the soft skills uh, that enable women to to survive in mining? Khalil, that was that was something I had my hand up for as well, because one of the biggest excuses in, in, in all industries is we don't have pipeline. We don't have a pipeline of women, you know, and um, in some cases it may be true, but, it, you know, 30 years after democracy, as Sonia said, it can't still be the case that we don't have pipeline. Mm -hmm. I can understand that in those rural areas, we might not do that. So um, we do a lot of outreach as mining companies, uh, career development, bursaries, uh, teaching, you know, going out to teach um, girl ch the girl child what it is to, to be in the mining industry. But I, I've been saying this for a while, and I know uh, the Alan Gray Orbis Foundation does this, and I think more organizations need to identify the girl child at intermediate stage of their, of their schooling life, not when they get to grade 10, 11, and 12, and then give them extra math classes. That's okay for those that are already in maths and science. But what do we do about our shining stars that are in the intermediate phases? By the time they come to high school, because of the, the pressures of the rural communities in which they live, because of the pressures of being a girl child with that mindset, with a community mindset, they've got so much added responsibility that by the time they get to high school, they may not choose maths and science because they've got to help run the home. So what we need to do is identify these, these um, well-performing young girls and take them out of that environment and, and focus, give them a chance at, 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 a, at a boarding school where they can only focus on their careers, where they realize that their job is not to 
help raise the family. You know, if it's if it's if it's not the boy child's job, it shouldn't be their job either. So that's what we that's what we should be doing. We should be taking them out, giving them a chance at life, and letting them choose um, choose maths and science at a later stage, and then go into these careers where we say there's a there's a shortage of of um, pipeline. But I also want to talk, talk about something that Kamase uh, touched on. You know, the, unfortunately, still the future of young girls is is dependent on how we raise our boys, and and it really does start at home. Um, it starts with how we raise our boys, what expectations they have um, from from women in work, women in the communities, women in the workspace, even even with the incidence of uh, gender based violence. It's uh, how do we raise our boys, and um, as as women, that that should be our primary objective as as mothers, because that's the one thing that's going to turn this all around. Um, in in relation to that, um, you know, you mentioned the issue of bursaries. Um, are, are we seeing enough women coming through the tertiary education system? If we go into a classroom at a university. Uh, for say mining engineering or some of the other um, uh, key skills that lead to a career uh, in mining, um, are we seeing um, are we seeing enough women in, in those classrooms? Far more than we were seeing before, um, so that's very encouraging. The problem is that once they get through that and they enter the work of world, uh, the world the world of work, how do we retain them? Because when when you have a choice to to do to do mining and you you subjected to gender based violence etc or uh, discrimination, and then a financial services company comes and says um, we'll support you to do uh, management consulting for us or a uh, big consulting company. That's where we lose our engineers. That's where we lose um, our geologists. That's where we lose our hard skills too because um, you've got a nine to five job. Uh, the policies are, are more favorable. The working conditions are more favorable. So. If we if we get them through through the schooling system and then get them through the tertiary education system, we lose them at uh, in the place of work. So there has to be more robust uh, retention strategies to to ensure that these women stay. Um, at the at the conference this afternoon, somebody said, when when we talk equality, the advantaged feel very threatened, and um, it's the same thing when we when we want to bring women. When, when we want to talk equality with women, I mean, we saw it in the days of apartheid as well, but when we want to talk about uh, equality with women, men feel threatened. And uh, and whether we like it or not, we're going to have to bring them on the journey. You know, I feel like Absolutely. not bringing them on the journey because I think you've had centuries of of um, reign. So just, sit, just, just wait, wait this one out and let us equalize, but we have to bring them in on the con in, into the conversation. Well, well, thank you, Fatima. And actually, that um, that leads very directly into um, a question that's been posted in the Q and A by uh, Niksha Singh, um, who's asking us whether any men registered for this uh, for this webinar. Well, I see there are about one hundred and twenty seven of us uh, on, on on this webinar, so I am assuming that some of us are men. Um, I don't know the answer. Perhaps uh, next year, Crema Media will uh, take a, a poll or something like that and see how many um, are men. Um, but I, 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 I'm personally seeing that in 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 workplaces um in um higher education institutions that there is a much greater uh, emphasis on on gender issues um not only among women but also among um uh, men who are leading so um i see we are beginning to run out of time and i see sonia's hand is up so i'm going to ask you sonia it um, was just, sorry it was just a quick point to say men as allies you raised such a good a good point and I think earlier there was talk about mentorship and coaching and I think male mentors often serve very well as well. Uh, that, that, that's a great point and, and funnily enough I think we can learn a lot um, from the world of sport uh, if, if we look at the recent Olympics um, very many of the um, of, of the female and um, the, the very successful female athletes that were coming through um, were, were coached by women but also equally by men um, and we know that we have to bring men in as allies. So very important to remember that. Uh, Numbu, so I wonder if you could address this last question uh, for us uh, that has been posted by Stembele Sihia. How do we change the mindset 
uh, or the mentality of men expecting more from women in both the workplace and at home. We might get it right uh, in the workplace, we might not at home. H how do we change uh, the attitudes of, of, of those around us, men that we live with and work with? I, I think, Lion, it starts from home. Uh, it starts from our background where we're told that uh, men are superior than us. I think that's where the problem is. So if we can, as women at home, address the issues at the early ages, just to encourage our girls, uh, let them know that they're having a position in this country. They are also a, can be able to stand by themselves. They've got a voice, they are powerful, they can be leaders. Uh, try to push and encourage them to be in that level. I think this will help. Coming back into the, into the organization, uh, again, you will see men uh, having that uh, position of saying they are superior than us. Even if you are in the same level, let's say you are all in the same level of being managers or in the leadership position, you will always see them taking that position uh, of being men, even going to an extent of saying, let's say we are having a dinner or lunch, they will say, ah, someone must dish for me. So men will always be like that, having that superior powers. But I believe as women, if we can start at the early ages, just to teach our kids, to teach our communities and let them know that they are also having a voice in this country. In RPIDZ, we have a program for young ladies at the age of uh, 14, the grade eight, where we invite them during holidays to come and have a feel on what IDZ is offering and what is IDZ, and also for them to be able to choose their careers correctly, especially to influence them to take the leadership positions. Because you will find that they will say, ah, oh, no, this is not suitable for me. Then we need to talk to them to encourage them that they are young girls, but they can also hold these positions and make examples uh, that they see in the country that this person is a CEO uh, and is a woman. And again, you can also be the CEO as a woman. So that encouragement can help our country uh, coming together as women and having initiatives to assist our girls can help as well. Thanks, Leo. Thank you very much. So we really are beginning to run out of time, but um, but there is one other point that's been made in the chat um, by, I think it was by Carrie uh, Bridell, um, who's just pointing out um, uh, particularly the issue of women uh, engineers and the small number of women who uh, remain on and become uh, professional engineers. And I just wanted to check in with you, Gamase. You work for a global company. Um, are you seeing uh, women engineers in, in Shell globally? Are you seeing in such a, um, a male-dominated industry as, as oil and gas, are you seeing women out there on the oil rigs um, in, in all of the environments in which uh, in which your company works? Thanks, Lyle. Most definitely. And I'll speak for my team because I do have a technical team reporting to me. If I look at the engineers um, that are within my team, uh, I have three ladies um, that are leading at the front. Um, going to the mines where we've got customers, mining customers, and really driving the engagements on total cost of ownership, which is what the mining companies are doing. And I'm talking about ladies that really drive the engagement with senior mining engineers, um, not um, artisans, in lack of a better word, not, I full, have full respect of artisans, but the caliber of the, of the people that we have. So there is a, an upward surge uh, in female engineers um, joining the sector. I think, though, the question, um, or, or rather maybe a comment, uh, just to add to what Fatima mentioned, is really about, you know, highlighting the opportunities in these sectors, because there is a shortage of skills. It's, it's a question of, do people know? Um, the, 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 the mining space, engineering space is very open. There is definitely a shortage. But now um, it, it's really about, you know, making people fully aware so that people can then tap into the, into, into this space. I think it's amazing. You know, we've heard we've heard from women in such diverse uh, uh, sectors today. We've heard from um, a woman who owns, who runs and owns a, a, a private equity company. Uh, we've heard from a woman in uh, Richards Bay, um, a, a sort of heavy industrial uh, area. Uh, we've heard from a woman uh, in the mining industry. We've heard from a woman in the oil and gas industry. And we've also heard quite a lot on the chat and on the Q&A uh, from women who are in diverse sectors uh, around the country. And honestly, I think this is what the women of 1956 were dreaming about. This is what the women of 1956 were fighting for. 
They were fighting for the place for all of us uh, to be able to reach our potential, uh, that each of us has human potential and we should not be held back uh, by some other uh, expectations. We should not be held back by anyone else in society who wants to limit us. We should not be held back by anyone who says that we belong only in the home and not in the workplace. Uh, so much has been achieved. Of course, we've heard today about how much more has to be achieved, uh, particularly in relation to workplace culture, particularly in relation to issues like bullying, particularly in relation to gender-based violence, uh, which is happening in our homes, but also in our workplaces. And this is, I think, an absolute priority uh, for all of us as women, um, much as we have made a, a lot of progress on the issue of representation. But I think we have not made enough progress uh, on the issue of uh, a workplace culture that really uh, empowers women. Uh, and, and especially uh, on the issue of gender-based violence. So I think that's something that we can all um, that we can all emphasize and take forward uh, wherever we are. I think we should all uh, be very grateful to uh, Crema Media and, and, and thank you, Shannon, to, to you and, and others at Crema Media who have organized this session, but also who organize it every year uh, because of your commitment uh, to seeing women succeeding in the factories, to seeing uh, women succeeding in the mines, uh, to seeing women succeeding on the oil rigs, uh, to seeing women succeeding uh, in the boardroom. Um, we're very, very happy that you gave us a platform to discuss all of this uh, today. and. Um, uh, just to uh, thank all the panelists, uh, not only for participating in this, I think, wonderful uh, conversation, but also for the work that you do out there every day um, uh, to take us forward as, uh, as women in the workplace. Shannon, five past three, uh, running out of time. We've had a great conversation. I think I'll hand over back to you. Thank you so much, Lael, and thank you for that very kind support. Um, we don't do this alone. I've got a team of wonderful women working with me. So we thank you for that. Um, that does bring us to the end of this webinar. I'd like to take this opportunity today. Thank you to you, Lael Bethlehem, for enabling a beautiful and engaging discussion. You will be pleased to know there were indeed a handful of men registered and attending the webinar. We hope many more will attend next time. Thank you also to our panelists, Nom Buson Sele from Richards Bay Industrial Development Zone, Gamase Sodaba from Shell Lubricants, South Africa, Sonia Debrain from Identity Partners, and Fatima Collins from Sibanya Stillwater. Thank you to our sponsors, Shell Lubricant South Africa and the Richards Bay Industrial Development Zone for their support in making this webinar possible. And finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on women in business. We hope you found this event engaging and informative. We really appreciate your participation. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at Thank you so much for your time and goodbye.